So let's resume our celebration of 10 of the best cash trips in all of Housewives history. If you haven't seen part one, it's linked below. Be sure to check that out, but let's get into the list. Next, let's check in with the OC girls, who in season 11 took a trip to Ireland. This was hosted by Megan King Edmonds, who was pregnant at the time. To set things up, Vicky and Kelly had been on the outs this season. Kelly, for constantly lashing out and saying things that were far below the belt, see my rookie video for further chat on this, and Vicky because of Cancergate, see my psychic video for further chat on this. Things had gotten better after the accident in Glamis Dunes, which bonded Vicky and Kelly to Heather and Tamara, and had placed Megan and Shannon on the outs. Things had mostly gotten resolved when the women dashed off for the Emerald Isle. When the women arrived, Vicky's boyfriend Steve had sent her a bouquet of flowers with a note saying he loved her, so it seemed as if Brooks was fully in the rearview mirror. Others have speculated that these flowers were sent by Vicky herself, but I'll leave that for you to decide. The women have a chill night, resting up for their adventure the next day, but I don't think they could have predicted how out of control it would get. Megan has set the women up on a bar crawl, joining them briefly before sneaking off to meet with her genealogist. Things are going fine, the women are having a whale of a time, until Kelly starts flicking noses. The women ask her to stop, and she is kind of playful aggressive, yelling at Tamara across the restaurant. All of a sudden, Tamara starts charging, and any playfulness that was there before drains out completely. The women start yelling at Kelly, who tells them to have a sense of humor. She thinks Heather should get it since she's Jewish. Heather tells her this is racist, which Kelly disagrees with. I'm not being racist, I'm Mexican. Tamara brings up Kelly looking into Heather's finances, and the shouting escalates with everyone in the pub staring. Vicky, who's been super close with Kelly, doesn't say a word as she's finally getting back into the women's good graces and doesn't want to ruin it. The fight spills out onto the Dublin streets, and an enraged Kelly takes a low blow while venting to Shannon. No wonder why her daughter doesn't talk to her. Shannon tells Tamara, who confronts Kelly in some off-camera physical altercation and runs into the van where Shannon tries to comfort her. Tamara looks absolutely rabid here. It kind of disturbs me, to be honest. The other ladies have been kicked out of the store they ducked into to a moment which has traumatized Heather greatly. I was just asked to leave a department store. I'm me too, by security. I'm in the bathroom and this is what I had on the door. Bang, bang, bang. Is there an American lady in there? <gasps> Things are really, really bad, and Megan is none the wiser until Kelly fills her in. Kelly opts out of the evening's dinner, and the women do what they do best, whoop it up. The next day, Megan and Kelly hit the streets in search of a relative of Megan's. Excuse me, what's your last name? Uh, Kevin. Kevin, no, no, that's my dad's first name. Oh, that's nice to hear. Finally finding someone who could possibly be an O'Toole. The other women hit up the farm where Bailey's is made, and we get some good Vicky content. Kelly and Megan join the other ladies for dinner in a Bailey's tasting, where Kelly attempts to apologize to Tamara, but she's not ready to discuss it and gives her an icy reception. I get Tamara's position here. Tamara had been a Kelly defender all season when the other women were really going after her, and Kelly went for the deepest wound she could muster. To be fair, she didn't intend for Tamara to hear it, but it's definitely hitting Tamara where it really hurts. The next day, Megan and Tamara visit a castle of sorts where an O'Toole was hanged, while the rest of the women go bike riding and have a picnic. It becomes very clear that Heather wants to get Kelly drunk. She pulls out a flask of Fireball, how declasse, and gives Kelly a glass of champagne, despite her saying no. This continues at dinner when Shannon does the same. Vicky is really starting to drift from Kelly and doesn't really have her back. That night, though this happens off camera, Vicky and Kelly went to Tamara's room to try to get her to come out to the bar and have them clear up the tension. Tamara refused but went out with the rest of the women, inviting Vicky, who went. She texted a picture of her and Vicky to Kelly and said that Vicky has told her everything Kelly's been saying. This naturally upsets Kelly, and we get cell phone footage captured by Heather of the women fighting in the hallway of the hotel. The women then board the van to go to the airport, most of them still drunk, and Kelly and Shannon start going at it. Kelly gets nasty and the fight escalates, with Heather accusing her of having a psychotic break. Kelly's had enough of Vicky not supporting her and reveals all of the nasty things Vicky said to her, including Tamara's husband cheating on her and being gay, and Shannon's husband of physically abusing her. This is obviously terrible and is made all the more chaotic with the grainy night cam that captures it. The trip ends with Megan telling us that she's on to Heather's pot stirring ways. This trip is absolutely legendary. It obviously has insane drama, especially with the pub crawl and the van ride, but also has some fun moments, especially from Vicky. The social dynamics are so delicate here, and the villain has been ever-changing this season, but it kind of ends right where the season started, with Vicky wearing the bad queen crown. In fourth place, we're heading to Zion via the Salt Lake City Housewives. We knew the trip would be good from the moment the ladies get in the Sprinter van and realize it's the same driver and van they were in when Jen was arrested. Things go insane immediately as Jen and Lisa nearly get into a physical altercation while en route. Mary and Meredith chose to travel separately. I'm so intrigued by their relationship, I'm almost tempted to do a deep dive and make a video so that I can figure it out, but I'm not sure if it's a bit passe at this point, so let me know if you still care or not. 
Lisa and Jen eventually come to an understanding and the ladies arrive at their beautiful house and get ready for a shamanic ceremony organized by Whitney. When Meredith and Mary arrive, bad weather attempts to hide. Mary is not into the ceremony, feeling that they shouldn't have to immediately get ready for the event the minute they get to the house. The ceremony is fine, I guess. Mary finally arrives and is just not into it and stands awkwardly off into the corner. The ladies sit down for their first dinner and the women immediately start laying into Meredith about her friendship with Mary. Things turn into Meredith first Jen and it's revealed that they may have dated the same man in New York while Seth and Meredith were on a break. No word on Coach Shaw's opinion on the matter. Jen is also missing a fingernail during the fight, which ups the ante on the chaos. It's also super clear that Whitney is doing all she can to stir the pot. She literally goes chasing after Meredith to get her to talk. She's also leading the charge with the questions around when exactly Meredith's father's memorial happened. If you remember, Meredith didn't ride in the van with them on the trip they'd taken previously, the trip which started out with Jen getting arrested. Meredith's reasoning was that she was already in Colorado for her father's memorial, so she'd just meet the women there. Whitney and the gang had gotten it into their heads that what was really happening was that Meredith was the one to call the feds on Jen, being the cause of her getting arrested. This is obviously insane as it had been a years long investigation and Meredith is not, to my knowledge, a time traveler, but they won't give into critical thinking and believe that the date of the alleged memorial is a smoking gun. At some point in the night, Lisa tells Meredith that the women are fixated on this and the placid morning is spoiled by Meredith screaming at everyone to stop talking about her family. You all can spew lies about me all day and night. Do not bring my sister or my father into it. Things chill out a bit and the women have a nice hiking trip and dinner and a relatively calm day of sisterhood bonding. The next day, the women take separate excursions with Whitney and Jen riding dune buggies or something of that sort. Mary, Meredith, and Jenny going to the spa and the big kicker rivals Heather and Lisa going horseback riding. The spa gang has a bit of drama with Mary's hatred of Jenny. Jenny asks her how her husband is doing and Meredith says that she doesn't know Jenny well enough to talk about something so personal. The other girls use the time to sit on mountains and speculate further on Meredith's dad's memorial and if Meredith called the feds. This speculation is so strange to me. Besides the fact that it's simply not true that Meredith called the feds, why is this what the women have set their sights on? One of their cast members has literally been arrested on felony charges of defrauding the elderly and the vulnerable, and another is being loosely accused of running a cult in which her parishioners believe her to be God, which she uses to pull ample amounts of cash out of, yet we are focused on the date of the memorial of your friend's father who recently passed away. Couple that with the fact that memorials, along with the general fog you're in after the death of a loved one, tends to be a multi-day thing with lots of visits with family. It just doesn't matter. But whatever, this is what the ladies have chosen. So back to the timeline. Jen has very enthusiastically planned a Cinco de Mayo celebration. The ladies look adorable as they get in the zone, except for Meredith being concerned about who is paying as she's worried she's taking money away from Jen's victims. Jen's really gone all out with her maracas and her mariachi band and presents the women with jewelry she has made for them, which Meredith accepts unceremoniously. It's all giggles until they start eating. Basically, everyone fights with everyone and Lisa Barlow eventually storms off in anger of Meredith's defense of Mary while not to her eyes defending Lisa. Heather had riled her up a bit on the mountain, telling her she's noticed that Meredith really doesn't have Lisa's back. You've been at odds with everybody in defense of Meredith. I just felt for you and I just, I feel like, I feel for me too. So she ends up going ballistic behind a closed door in a hot mic moment. Piece of I have your back and I'm offended by that you that piece of garbage whore. I hate her, she's a whore, she's half of New York. It's honestly shocking. Meredith and Lisa had talked about their decades-long friendship. Lisa had cried when Meredith told her she and Seth were taking time apart the previous season because their families were just so close. Even though there was some tension because of Mary and Jen, it didn't seem like it was to the level of hatred being spewed by Lisa. I get venting, but this was hitting Meredith and her family from all angles. I'm definitely eager to see season three to see if there's more to the story and witness how the two interacted with each other going forward because it wasn't great at the reunion. The other ladies eventually trickle back inside and keep going at it. Lisa goes on more rants. I am f***ing richer than all of you. I don't need to f***ing be here. Okay, and Meredith and Lisa scream at each other some more. Whitney tries to talk to Meredith and Mary, and Mary's reaction is just so funny. Don't come in here bothering me, okay? The women wake up to an awkward morning. Meredith agrees to ride back in the van simply so that the other women aren't able to talk about her the whole time, while Mary opts to take a private car. I started to sense some tension between the two of them towards the end of this trip. I'm curious if other people felt it too. I'm guessing that Meredith was seeing that their friendship was causing so many issues with the other women and was second guessing if it was worth the headache that it came with it. I guess she won't have to worry about it going into season three. All in all, this trip was just constant chaos. It's wild to me that it topped the trip where Jen got arrested, but it's really just a modern classic. Plus, even with all the drama, we had a lot of fun moments with the women. They had Club Zion and we had Heather being her colorful narrator self. Mary had a hot mic moment of her own. She don't even know she's looking at bread. And it truly made Meredith an icon. 
I was worried I was playing into recency bias, but I really think that this trip will be remembered for the ages, so I feel great about its inclusion on this list. In third place, we're off to Amsterdam with the season five Beverly Hills Girls. Now, this was Yolanda's trip, obviously, and she set up a semi-cute little scavenger hunt for the big reveal. She, Brandy, Rena, Kyle, and Kim took a mini trip on the way, stopping in Canada for a gala for the Foster Foundation, and tensions were running high from the jump. If you remember, this was Rena and Eileen's first season, and they were kind of obsessed with Kim's sobriety. After a weird situation at Eileen's poker party, they'd been questioning her sobriety to her face and behind her back. Brandy told Kim what she'd been hearing before the trip, and Kim is locked and loaded against Rena. After an icy salutation before the ladies boarded Yolanda's private plane to Canada, Rena asked Kim if she's mad at her, and the two start getting into it in front of Babyface. Kim asked Rena to drop the issue that it's private and not something she wants to discuss further. The gala is a cute moment. Brandy makes the odd choice of wearing faux bangs, while Rena and Kyle fangirl over Steven Tyler. And then the ladies are off to the Netherlands, with plans to meet Eileen and LVP there. We get some classic Richard sister drama when Kyle loses her bag full of jewelry, eventually finding it, causing the women to be late. Kim is mad at Kyle over this because she feels like Kyle is always mad at her whenever she's late, and now Kim gets to send that energy back to her. The women finally make it to the hotel where they join forces with LVP and Eileen and go out to eat. Little did they know that history was about to be made because this is that meal. Yolanda starts a conversation with the attempt to get the other women to open up to each other. Rinna talks about her sister who overdosed and about Harry Hamlin's battle with substance abuse. She apologizes to Kim if she's been laying into her too hard, and instead of accepting it and moving on, Kim completely turns the tables on Rinna. She says that she too is worried about Rinna. I'm concerned about you. First of all, this let's not talk about it. Nice. Excuse, excuse me. me. I'm concerned about nice you home. at your situation at home. You want to bring out my stuff? Let's talk about your home Kim. life. And when Eileen jumps in to defend her soap star bestie, Kim clears her too. I'll Shut your you. mouth. I've had enough of you, you beast. Beast? Yeah. How dare you? This escalates and Kyle jumps in, forcing Kim to also attack Kyle. Kathy would no, not I ever act like this. Kim. Kathy would have my back like a real sister. With her sights set back on Rena, she delivers one of her most iconic lines let's for talk three about years. The husband. Oh, wait, excuse me. Did you just say let's, let's talk about not, the husband? Let's not talk about what you don't want to help. Causing Rena to lunge at her as if she's going to wring her neck and smashes her glass on the table. Kyle and the other women book it out of there, sending the group back to their sides of the ring. Honestly, I'm Team Kim on this one. Rena and Eileen had really been fixated on her sobriety, something she'd ostensibly worked really hard at maintaining. She'd had some of her worst moments played out on television to be picked apart by the public. There's a lot of shame that's wrapped up in addiction, and I don't blame her for wanting to handle things a bit more privately. She'd made it clear that this isn't something she wanted brought up any further, especially at a table full of women with cameras capturing the whole thing. I think at the time, a lot of people were Team Rena, but now that we know how she operates, at least on the show, you've got to wonder if she was looking for a fight. You don't need to be famed psychic medium Alison Dubois to anticipate this type of reaction from Kim. She'd done it before and she'd do it again. Plus, Kim was handling attack from nearly all angles. Her only ally was Brandy, who had her own issue with LVP to worry about. And I guess Yolanda, though she was trying so hard to make this a nice trip since they were in her hometown and was dealing with her health issues, so Kim was mostly left on an island. She was also being ostracized by her own sister. Her attack was definitely more severe than any of the women, especially Rena and Eileen, may have been expecting, but they were humiliating her. She was also dealing with her first husband, Monty, dying, so Kim had a lot of pent-up emotion. I want to hear other people's thoughts on this, so let me know what you think. All right, but let's jump back into the timeline of the trip. So Yolanda is worried after this nuclear attack that the women will act up while visiting her mother, but Brandy and Kim assure her that they will not be the ones instigating anything. The women head to Yolanda's hometown the next day, riding bikes and coming across an old lover of Yolanda's who lives in a windmill and have a sweet visit with her mom and brother. They decide to do as the Dutch do and try a space cake, aka an edible. The women, especially Kyle, are all playing coy and acting as if they'd never normally do this and are hemming and hawing until Brandy basically tells them to cut it out, that the last time she gotten high was with Kyle herself. The women get upset with Brandy and I get it. Kyle says she doesn't want her kids to know, and I understand Brandy's frustration with the lying, but it's not Brandy's fun fact to share. It is kind of funny to look back on now, though, because Kyle's husband, Mauricio, no longer hides the fact that he's constantly high, but it wasn't a cool thing to do on Brandy's end. The ladies hit the streets of Amsterdam, and Brandy and Kyle start getting into it. Kim isn't there to back Brandy up, and Yolanda is focused on her brother, so she's alone to fight the women on the fact that they have different standards for her than for everyone else. 
I can sympathize with Brandy on this. Anytime she does something, which to be fair is quite often, the other women really evoke that shame and talk about how she takes things too far. But whenever she's on the defense, the sympathy never goes to her. The next day, Yolanda is out of commission as her lime is flared up, an omen of what was to come the next season. But she talks to Kyle for a while about how she would never have that type of relationship with her brother as Kyle has with Kim and wants Kyle to take accountability for her part. Kyle and Eileen spend the day sightseeing while Brandy, Kim, Renna, and LVP go shopping. This is crazy to everyone as obviously Kim and Renna aren't in a good place. Though they had talked things out the day after the big fight, the big draw here, at least for me, was Brandy and LVP being together again. We see them joking around like they did in the past and it gives everyone a glimmer of hope. LVP admits that she loves the sight of Brandy and I get the sense that she was wanting to make up with her a bit. Renna and Kim are both trying with each other too. It's a bit awkward but I feel like there's a pull between the two of them, almost like their souls know each other. They've got a chemistry even if it typically produces a negative reaction. Eileen is pissed about this though. She doesn't understand why Rena is acting like nothing happened with Kim. She gets a glass of wine with Rena and confronts her about this and at first I was annoyed with Eileen because she was so fixated on this and wouldn't let it go but then I started to wonder if this is actually a very normal reaction as it's her first season and she hasn't gotten a feel for how quickly conflict moves or at least should move on a housewife show. Kyle is also kind of annoying me because she's acting as if the situation is all black and white, where Kim and Brandy are all bad, whereas she and the other ladies are all good. Kim and Brandy certainly aren't angels, but the other women aren't treating them very well either. Everyone's gray. I think this lack of accountability is what stops the audience from siding with Kyle en masse. She sets Brandy and Kim up to take on that underdog role, which is hard not to root for. The women then have dinner on a boat, a fatal error in the world of housewives, and Brandy and Eileen start getting into it. Things seem to have been resolving until Brandy makes a joke about Eileen being a homewrecker, which we all know is about the worst thing you can be in the eyes of Brandy, and things get rolling again. It's kind of interesting that LVP gets fixated on this comment when later in the series she would have a conflict with Eileen over this exact thing. The fight escalates into Brandy versus everyone, especially Kyle. Kim is really upset about how bad things have gotten with Kyle on this trip and seems to be icing up a bit with Brandy. The women slowly mosey over to the dinner table and Brandy suggests a game where they say what they like about each other. Most of the women take it seriously and offer very kind words to one another, while Brandy stays focused on how they look. It's very strange and only gets stranger when Brandy's turn comes and she runs off and locks herself in the bathroom. I get that she's feeling very insecure and ostracized in the moment and may be worried that the woman won't have anything nice to say, but she suggested this entire game come to be. Did she bring it up simply to backhandedly insult the other women by insinuating that they have nothing to offer beyond their looks? It's unclear. She finally comes out and the women have kind things to say to her. As they are leaving the boat, Brandy is talking about the guy that she likes in Amsterdam. She's joking around with LVP and wants to demonstrate a kiss with her. LVP is not open to her and tells her this. Brandy tells LVP to slap her and once again, she rejects this. I guess in an effort to incite LVP to slap her, Brandy slaps Lisa. Not hard, but I think it just surprised her. She immediately tells her that it's wrong, but doesn't have a super loud reaction to it until she spends most of the next day talking about it. I'm curious what other people think about this. Obviously, Brandy was just being playful and wasn't intending on harming LVP in any way, and they did used to have more of a silly relationship, but I know a lot of people are in the mindset that being physical like this is never okay. The women go shopping, and Brandy attempts to buy LVP flowers and apologize, but LVP is totally radicalized against her at this point. Brandy doesn't know what to do beyond apologize. When Yolanda tries to step in and talk LVP down, LVP gets mad at Yolanda for allowing Brandy to behave this way and excuse her behavior with a, that's just Brandy being Brandy. As the ladies get ready for a final dinner, Yolanda talks to Brandy and they decide it's better she just not go. Brandy goes on a date with a guy she met in Amsterdam, who, as it turns out, is a friend of LVP's son, Max. LVP doesn't like this, and when Kyle finds out that the two have spent the night together, she ensures that Lisa becomes aware of this, further severing any hope that Brandy and LVP would make up. This is one of Beverly Hills' most notorious trips and is for a good reason. Obviously, Kim clearing the table is one of the most iconic meals in housewife history, producing several of Beverly Hills' most quoted lines, but beyond that, we had so much more. The tension between LVP and Brandy is compelling. I know I love their friendship so much and seeing that little bit of hope only for it to be squandered with a slap is heartbreaking. Lisa Rinna is pretty interesting here. Obviously, it produced one of the biggest mysteries in the housewives world when Kim said let's talk about the husband and Rinna's reaction told us that there was something to know about Harry Hamlin. I'm so curious. I know there's a lot of rumors out there, but let me know what your theory is. We also see that she's able to move on from conflict, which is a good quality in a housewife. I was also surprised with just how much Eileen annoyed me on this trip because I typically like her. She was so focused on shaming Kim and Brandy while not acknowledging anyone else's wrongdoing when she's normally pretty good at seeing both sides. I guess she was still finding her footing within the world. I also love the location. It made it special that this was Yolanda's hometown and I loved all of the biking, canals, and windmills that the Netherlands had to offer.
In second place, we once again see the ladies of New York, this time going down to Cartagena, Colombia for their season 10 cash trip. This was planned by Tinsley, who had the most ingenious way to select rooms. The women, specifically Ramona, always make a spectacle of what room they're in, so Tinsley comes up with a foolproof plan. She gets the ladies all Tiffany's necklaces with their initial on it. As they go through the rooms, they open a box and the initial on the necklace determines who stays in that room. She's brilliant. Tinsley is in a bit of a love bubble with Scott. At one point, he sends her a massive flower arrangement made up of 365 roses. It kind of looked like a funeral flower thing. Too big, it needed to stand in a dead body. Along with a Cartier bracelet sent along with Tinsley's new bestie, Carol. Bethany vs. Carol is in full force. Bethany is just cracked out of her mind on this trip. She's having constant meltdowns, getting mad at everyone about everything and complaining just constantly. Carol has officially had enough and is mostly icy with Bethany, who is forced to buddy up with Luann and Sonia. I think Sonia is just really excited to have so much attention from Bethany. The first time Hell Breaks Loose is at a group dinner in which Carol and Bethany are sorting out their issues slash going at it, mere feet away from Dorinda and Luann who are also going at it. Dorinda is truly in monster mode, calling the recently arrested Lou a convict, a felon, and an ex-countess. It's just so cruel and really out of nowhere as Dorinda and Luann had been really close. Luann is just beside herself as she's not drinking and is clearly going through a lot. We get one of my favorite Dorinda moments ever when she talks to Carol about how non-judgmental she is just moments after she's tore Luann's heart out of her chest. I don't care if you are the biggest heroin order, uh, era, heroin addict prostitute on the street. I would never shame you. I would invite you to my house and say, what the is going on? Do you think she was trying to help you? Like... Help me for what? Bethany and Luann speculate on Dorinda's potential issues with alcohol while all this is going on. It's ugly but still fascinating to see Dorinda go. We also have the iconic Joker mustache scene here. Another fantastic moment is when Luann defends her continued use of the Countess title. Let's talk to Queen Latifah and let's talk to Lady Gaga. Is Lady Gaga lady? Bye. Bye. She's also gearing up for her cabaret show, Hashtag Countess and Friends, with Sonia as a supporting figure. Lou's just given us so, so much. Towards the end of the trip, the women take a boat ride to an island, and on the way back, things go terribly wrong. The water gets choppy, then choppier, then suddenly all of the women are throwing up and freaking out, and an ominous black screen appears on camera, and we're told via text that the crew had to stop filming for everyone's safety. Apparently this was pretty major and the women had an intense call with Bravo. We don't see much else beyond this except for the women, Sans, Tinsley, and Bethany all getting horrible diarrhea after drinking the water. This trip is just utter chaos, not only with the feuds between the ladies, but also with all the elements the universe has put them up against, namely water. Dorinda was so cruel on this trip, it made me feel bad for Luann, which is a rare feat as much as I love me some Countess. Bethany was absolutely unhinged, which always makes for spectacular television. There's one scene where she's just wandering around crying with a light up balloon, and it's gone entirely underreported upon. Plus, we've got my favorite New York cast all together in a country rarely visited by housewives. We didn't get too much of a cultural experience, but the B roll was super cool. The Roni girls never fail on vacation, and this was one of their greatest performances. First place, of course, you already know, takes us to Atlanta when the ladies travel to South Africa in season four. Nene kicks off the drama immediately by inviting rookie friend of that season, Marlo, telling nobody but Cynthia so everyone is surprised at the airport. Honestly, thank God Nene took the liberty because this trip was truly all about Marlo, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The women cause a scene immediately upon landing, trying to fill an elevator with way more bags than is reasonable. Side note, Nene and Marlo brought an absurd amount of luggage. Nene and Marlo have minimally 20 pieces of Louis Vuitton luggage. Did they bring some canned goods with them? The women finally find their way out of the airport and Marlo immediately starts annoying everyone in the van, first by preemptively complaining about the rooming situation, despite not being invited, then by talking ad nauseum about etiquette. It's kind of funny to see fellow etiquette extraordinaire Phaedra face off with her. Someone asked you to pass the salt. How do you pass it on the table? Do you pass the pepper with or just the salt? I would think you would just pass the, well, I guess you'll pass. I don't want some. You've got to love that Southern charm. Marlo continues her reign of terror as the women tour the penthouse suite in Cape Town, demanding that she has all of the names of the cleaning staff. Now is probably a good time to remind you all that this was not only an alliance season, but a named alliance season, as we had the Talls, aka Cynthia, Nini, and Marlo, versus the Smalls, aka Sheree, Phaedra, Candy, and Kim, though Kim isn't on this trip. More on that later. So Sheree has a friend in Atlanta that also has a place in Cape Town and he's invited her to dinner. She invites Phaedra and Candy, but not Nini because they hate each other at this point. I am very rich, bitch. She didn't invite Cynthia because she thought her and Nini were attached at the hip, nor did she invite Marlo who she didn't know was coming. 
On the trip, she starts to see that Cynthia is her own person and ends up inviting her to the dinner. Cynthia confirms that Marlo and Nini are still not invited, then scurries back to tell her fellow Talls. Marlo is not having it and runs to confront Sheree. Sheree immediately invites her, but it's not enough, and the two devolve into one of the strangest fights of all time. They trade low blows. At one point, Marlo uses the F slur for gay men, which many have speculated is one of the top reasons it took so long for her to get a peach. After that, the women descend into these weird guttural sounds at each other. It's bizarre. Eventually, the fight breaks up, and the smalls head off to dinner in a fire breathing show, while the talls head to dinner at Nobu. During this, it becomes pretty evident that there's some tension between Marlo and Cynthia. Marlo is new in the group, and despite some early awkwardness with Nini over Charles Grant, the two have become obsessed with each other, especially on Nini's end. I get the sense that Cynthia is being left out a little bit, as Nini's found a new bestie, a role which had previously been Cynthia's. The ladies then leave Cape Town and head out for a safari. While seeing the animals, Marlo's biggest takeaway is that the zebras would make a fantastic rug. This is gonna be amazing, I put it in the room with the uh, carpet. The next day is one of my favorites. The women have plans to visit an orphanage, but when they see a group of school children outside on their lunch break, they go and hang out with them. They dance and sing songs with the women, and it's a really sweet moment. Candy sees a dance move she hopes to take back to the States. They ask the kids if they need any supplies and hit up the store and essentially buy it out with plans to give everything out to the students and the kids at the orphanage they plan to attend. It's very moving to see the ladies really putting their money to good use, and it's sweet seeing them figure out what people truly want and need. While on the way to the orphanage, they see some people on the side of the road and pass out supplies. Nini feels a kinship to a mini tall in training, and it's sweet seeing the kids so elated to have new toys. The orphanage is very touching as well. The teacher there explains that most of the kids either have AIDS or were abused in their homes, which is devastating to the ladies, and we see a change in perspective even if it's short-lived after the experience. I really think that this is all Phaedra. I know with the terrible circumstances of her exit, her legacy has been majorly tarnished, but throughout her time on the show, she showed us through many examples that she really cares about making the world a better place. Expect a deeper look into this in a future video. The ladies also visit a psychic of sorts, and the experience is a bit chilling. It's clear that the culture is a bit different over there because he snaps at them saying a woman cannot touch his supplies. They are a bit creeped out when he says he is burning bones of ancestors. Phaedra is especially uncomfortable, but the ladies realize it's just shells and stick with it. When he gets into the readings, it's pretty revealing. My favorite was his read on Candy. He said she'd marry the man she's living with. She doesn't know how to take this as her most recent love interest, AJ, died after season two. He pivots to talking about AJ, but what we know now is that she did end up marrying Todd Tucker, who is working on production and very reasonably could have been sleeping not too far away from Candy on this very trip. He also said that Marlo hadn't met a man who truly loved her, which she confirms, and he says that Sheree will never marry again. Sheree keeps her composure and says that she knows in her heart she will marry again, but as of now, with the Tyrone situation not seeming too promising, is starting to seem a little grim. She's still got time, and hopefully she's happy in whatever way her life unfolds. His read on Nini is pretty revealing as well. If you remember, she's just recently divorced Greg. The psychic says that Nini's not happy. She tries to add in my marriage, but he says no, in general you're not happy. This upsets her and the experience seemingly comes to a close. She and Marlo cheer themselves up by hosting the women in their room for an early version of The Archive, in which Marlo displays the shoes and bags she brought on the trip. The small still have the visit to the orphanage fresh in their mind and find the juxtaposition a little bit off-putting. I mean, she brought 29 pairs of shoes on a safari, but Marlo is the fashion queen, so we've gotta just accept her as she is. But the next day, Marlo wakes up sick. There is speculation that the psychic put a curse on her, but whatever the cause, it means she's out for the day. Nini volunteers to stay behind and act as a nurse, meaning that Cynthia has some quality time with the smalls. She reveals that Marlo is kind of grating on her, and the conversation shifts to Kim Zolciak, who, as I mentioned, is not on the trip. Cynthia says she cannot see Kim in South Africa holding a baby at the orphanage. Candy laughs and kind of agrees, but doesn't say too much on her own. Cynthia definitely brought the conversation up. Later on, the Smalls call Kim and Sheree lets her know in front of Candy that Candy didn't think Kim would come to Africa and hold a black baby. This obviously upsets Kim and she vents to Sweetie. The ladies go to a final dinner where Candy confronts Marlo over her obsession with labels and Nini accuses the Smalls of blindly following Kim Zolciak, which is ridiculous and insulting to the other Smalls. This is just such a fantastic, well-rounded trip. It has the iconic memorable moments, especially with the Marlowe vs. Sheree fight in Cape Town that still gets flashed back to. It also has those little subtle moments of comedy, such as Sheree dryly suggesting her, Nini, and Phaedra room together. 
There are also plenty of cute Candy and Phaedra being besties moments, rest in peace. Plus, it isn't just about luxury and shopping and all of that the way trips normally are. Hanging out with the kids at the school in the orphanage seems to have really touched the women. I think it also gave the Bravo audience a glimpse into a country and continent we don't get to see too often on TV, unless you specifically seek it out. I think they also gave us a seemingly well-rounded view of South Africa, showing us the cosmopolitan city of Cape Town as well as the more rural areas. This trip was also pretty consequential. One small silly thing is that it really brought Marlo in as the fashion queen and we saw it spilling out onto Nini. Of course, it would take Erica Jane on Beverly Hills to introduce the true costumey type of fashion situation we find ourselves in now, but Marlo definitely upped the ante. I also think that this was the real beginning of the Kim Zolciak disconnection. She's in a love bubble with Croy, having just given birth to their first baby together, so she's not on the trip. There's actually a random Andy narrated one-off special called Kim Loves Croy planted in the middle of these episodes, but I think her absence on this trip is ultimately a good thing. Even though I think Kim was a really, really fun housewife, this trip showed that Atlanta didn't need her and could exist past Kim vs. Nini. She really didn't last all that much longer on the show past this trip, just about half a season. And the last thing, of course, was that Candy met her future husband, Todd, on this trip. I'm a romantic at heart, so it was fun seeing Candy in these last few moments before she truly met the one. We don't hear about this until later on, but I don't know, I just thought it was cool to know her life was about to change and she didn't even know it. Alright, that's my list, at least for part one. Let me know which trips that were left off shouldn't have been so I know what you want to see in the next video on this topic. If you liked the video, like it and subscribe to the channel. Feel free to follow me on social media. My Twitter and Instagram ats are deeply super fish. I'll link it below. And don't forget, if you ever become a housewife and you're on a cash trip and someone suggests you take a boat, run the other way. Alright, well I'll see you in the next video. Bye!